Well, thank you, Dr. Lytle, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan White, and up until last week, I was an executive pastor at Parker Hill Church. I was not fired. Uh, everything's okay. Um, my family and I were taking a giant step of faith and moving to Dallas, Texas to get more ministry training. And so let me just introduce you to my family. That's my wife, Robin, our two little boys, Aiden and Gavin. And that little blondie is my little girl, Maddie. Now, fun fact for everyone, I wrote, co-directed, and premiered a short film while I was in college. And my co-director, he went on to be an actor, and I went on to be a pastor, so I don't know what that says about my skills, but here's the thing about movies. I, I want to talk about scripts. For the next couple times that we have together, I want to talk about flipping the script. And so I need your help as we get started. I want you to Turn to someone nearby and answer this question on the count of three. What is one of your favorite movies? One, two, three, go. All right. If you said The Princess Bride, you're right. I love, way to go. I love uh, movies, I love watching them, I love analyzing them. I'm the kind of guy that watches all the bonus features. Maybe you're like me, you like to know how movies are made. I love the, the writing and the camera angles and the special effects. But before the director ever says action, there is something called a script. And a script is pages and pages of words. These words make up the story written down before it's acted out. The script is the core narrative of the story. It determines where the story goes. That's the script. And so before we go any further, I've got to ask your help one more time. And when I say go, I want you to share the answer to this question with someone nearby. Here's the question. Who is the most influential person in your life? Go. All right, the question was, who is the most influential person in your life? Here's the answer. You are. You are. Author Paul Tripp put it this way. No one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. He goes on to say that you are in an underlying conversation with yourself that never ends. You're talking to yourself all the time interpreting, organizing, and analyzing what's going on inside you and around you, which begs the question, what do you regularly tell yourself about yourself, God, and your circumstances? This internal monologue, it runs constantly. Some studies estimate that you have between 25 to 70,000 thoughts a day, 70% of which are negative. It's hard to track when does one thought end and another begin. What we do know is that this dialogue is constant. Sometimes you're aware of it, and sometimes it's chugging along in the background, out of sight and unnoticed. No one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. And those thoughts, one right after another, day after day, they form a story. And that story is your script. That's your narrative. It's the story you tell yourself. And we all have a script. And that script drives our lives. Now understand me. Your script does not make up reality. But it does determine how you respond to reality. And we all have a script that drives our lives. And they're the words that shape our story every day. And you've been adding to your script from the day you were born. Until you walked in here with one that you have right now. And it's a draft and it will change, but it's the one that's driving your life now. You know what I see happening? Working with students and, and adults all around me, I've noticed something. Even though our thoughts are so influential, we tend to ignore their impact. There they are, just driving the story of our days, and we give them almost free reign in our lives. It's as if we believe this statement, your thoughts are harmless. Your thoughts are harmless. Which reminds me of the first time I ever rode a horse. It was the summer during college when I was a camp counselor. And one of those weeks was at horse camp. 
And so at that point, I thought horses were really cool because I love Lord of the Rings and I wanted to ride one like Aragorn. So one by one, they introduced the campers to their horse and then, and then they'd get on it. So they would say, here's the name of your horse, meet your horse, and now get on. And they kind of moved them down the line. When it came to me, though, my first clue that this was going to be interesting was that he, he wouldn't tell me the name. He just said, get on the horse. So I got on the horse. And once I got on, he said, meet mischief. Mischief. Now, how did she get that name? Well, she happened to be um, the kind of horse that liked to knock riders off her back. And so, at that point, I'm thinking horses aren't very cool anymore. And so, we're riding single file in line. It's pretty, you know, innocuous. And, and, and Mischief then starts to act up and live up to her name. And she drifts stubbornly towards trees and low-hanging branches and tries to knock me off her back. I take a limb to the top of the head and it scrapes up my arms. I I start to imagine this horse in front of me as this bottle of glue. I'm not into horses anymore. And through a series of unfortunate events that I don't have time to relate to you, I find myself by myself in the woods. Just me and my new friend, Mischief. And in that moment, I decided I don't want to end up knocked out or dead. And so I looked at Mischief and I realized like, th this is a very powerful animal weighing thousands, hundreds of hundreds of pounds, more than me. And she could take me anywhere she wanted to. She could run me into any obstacles she wanted. She could totally take over. And then I looked at these things in my hand, the, the harness, the reins, and I realized I have the power to steer this powerful force. And so I did. I, I acted with a confidence that I did not feel. I, I told Mischief where to go clumsily at first and then eventually with greater and greater confidence. And I kid you not, eventually we were charging up steep hills and down the other side. We were weaving in and out of trees as I flicked the reins back and forth. And I had to lean back doing the sweet mo move like from the movies. And we got out of the woods and we got caught back up and it was epic and only God saw it. So you're just have to believe me, but it was, it was pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And that's how it is with the, the things we tell ourselves. They are powerful and can take us crashing into obstacles. But they can also be guided with a firm hand towards better places. See, this is the lie. Your thoughts are harmless. But this is the truth. Your thoughts need a harness. See, one day Jesus was having a heated argument with the religious leaders of his day who... who hated him because he threatened their power and revealed their corruption. And he leans over to his followers and delivered a profound statement, a statement that is etched into college campuses and government buildings and houses of worship, the phrase that appears in our CIA headquarters in a very prominent place, across from the wall with, that mark, with the stars that mark the lives of the 117 who have fallen in the line of duty. Across from that are these words from John 8, 31 and 32. Where Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, the lies lock us up, the truth sets us free. Uncontested lies lead us into a cell, truth breaks us out. Now you see why the script is so important. So today, and with my time here, I simply want to do this. I want to help you learn how to flip the script, to edit the story that you're living from. To flip the script means to change one's story, or the flipping of the script, that phrase also means when new information reverses the situation. It's that moment when new revelation comes in, it takes the story in a new direction. And that's what I want to see happen in your life this year. To take what is untrue and leading you down the wrong path and flip the script so that what is true is leading you down the right path. And that's what Jesus is offering us today. This is the lie. Your thoughts are harmless. This is the truth. Your thoughts need a harness. And to find out how to harness your thoughts, we're going to look at Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 9 together. Now, the book of Romans is often considered the most significant book in the Bible, and Romans chapter 8 is considered the high point of Romans. And so there's a lot of really good stuff in this one chapter. But we're just going to look at one paragraph together. And before we jump in, you need to understand a couple of key words that the, the writer, the Apostle Paul, is going to use. And the first word is flesh. 
which means sinful desires. To live according to the flesh is the way that you would live without God in your life. It's selfish. It's me-centered. It's bad. And Paul, he contrasts that with a second word in another way of living life. This is the word spirit, which means the Holy Spirit living inside every Jesus follower. And the Spirit produces godly desires inside of us to live according to the Spirit is the way that we would go with God. So with these two definitions in mind, let's look at Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So first notice this, that the Spirit wants to change what we think. The Spirit wants to shift the script from the flesh to the Spirit, to God's things. And Paul is saying, before God, you didn't have a chance of winning the fight and walking in the right way, but now it's changed. It's changed because you have God's Spirit inside of you. And as we see here, the Spirit of God is the power behind walking with God. The Spirit guides us, empowers us, and teaches us. See, Paul is telling us to set our minds on the things of the Spirit, and Paul's not just saying set your mind on theology in general. He's saying pay attention to where the Spirit is giving direction dynamically now. God walks with us. We walk with, with Him. And so when the Spirit shows you how to overcome temptation, do you take that path or do you just plow forward into sin? And when the Spirit shows us the cracks in our character, do we get help or pretend things are fine? You see, the Spirit is in us, drawing our attention to truth and the true path. Now, notice the connection Paul is making through, between these three things. He says, your focus leads to your actions, which lead to your results. Your focus leads to what you do, your behavior, which leads to the outcome, which is your life experience. So if you focus on the flesh, that leads to some action, that's godless living, which leads to death, which is the results. If you spoke, focus on the spirit and the things of the spirit, that leads to some action that's godly living, which then leads to life and peace. Which means, and if I could just try to summarize everything I'm trying to say in one sentence, it would be this, that your life will always go in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Your life will always go in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Because underneath your every action or reaction is a belief, a story that you tell yourself. And if your script is based on truth, it will lead to godly living and life and peace. But if your script is based on lies, it will lead to godless living and the consequences that none of us care to experience. Your life will always go in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And Paul beats this drum no less than, three, than five times in the three verses. He uses the words mindset twice in verse 5. That's where we put our attention. Then he expands it to mind governed three times in verses 6 and 7. That's what thoughts rule our mind. So your thoughts are a big deal because your life will always go in the direction of your strongest thoughts. God wants us to understand this because our enemy certainly does. In the same passage where Jesus tells us that the truth will set us free, he warns us that Satan is a liar in the father of lies. That means Satan's native language is lies. It, fly, it flows out of him without any effort. He laces every sentence with smooth and seductive half-truths that sounds so right, but take us right off track. He is a smooth operator. He has done much in the world to create a place where lies are accepted and expected and even permitted. He wants to get you to believe the lies. He wants to say it so often that it sticks. He wants to do it so stealthily that it becomes a part of your script so that eventually you are enslaved and you don't even know it. The stakes are high. 
Your thoughts are not harmless. Your thoughts need a harness. Your thoughts need to be guided by truth. And here's the thing about the lies that we believe that you just need to understand. They're believable. These lies are believable. Otherwise, we wouldn't believe them. They usually contain a portion or partial truth. They're widely accepted by many. They get repeated often, and so they become more believable because you've heard it a lot. For example, I don't know about you, but I heard this medical advice when I was growing up. I was taught that you need to wait 30 minutes after eating, before swimming, otherwise you'll get a cramp and you could, you could drown. And that's an old lie. Debunked by doctors today, it was included, though, in Scouting for Boys, published in 1908, this way. So this goes way back. First, there's the danger of cramp. If you bathe, that swim, within an hour and a half after taking a meal, that is, before your food is digested, you're very likely to get cramp. Cramp doubles you up in extreme pain so that you cannot move your arms or legs, and down you go, you may drown, and it will be your own fault. That's, that's intense. It's not true. But how many of you have waited before going to swim? How many of you jumped in anyway after you ate a sandwich? You daredevils. All right. See, here's the thing. Once you believe a lie to be true, it can have the same power over you as if it were true, even if it's not. Don't miss this. Once you believe a lie to be true, it can have the same power over you as if it were true, even if it's not. Because if you believe it, it affects how you live. You don't go swimming. It affects you, even if it's not a fact of life. So they're believable, but they're, that makes them powerful. Because when we follow them, they control the direction of our lives. It's what pilots call black hole vertigo. So John Mark, he's a pilot of a 165 million F-16 fighter. He described black hole vertigo this way. He says, there was a time when I was absolutely 100% positive that I was flying straight and level, but my instruments told me that I was banking to the right with my nose pointed below the horizon, which means I was in a spiraling dive, headed down toward the ground at 300 miles per hour. You see, what happens during black hole vertigo is, is that your, your eyes and the fluid in your ears, they start to play tricks on you, convincing you that up is down and down is up. And so you can crank the stick to pull up, but instead of pulling up, you actually plummet towards the ground. And so when John Mark was asked, what did you do? He said, I trusted my instruments. And it's a good thing, too, since I was only 3,000 feet above the ground, it wouldn't have been long before I was dead. So get this, a well-trained expert fighter pilot can be absolutely positive that up is down and down is up, that left is right and right is left, that what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right. And if he doesn't pay attention to his instruments, giving him accurate readings, and instead goes with what seems right to him in the moment, he will crash. And the same is true in the story of our lives. It's possible to be absolutely certain that up is down and down is up, that right is wrong and wrong is right. You can be so convinced that you would swear on a stack of Bibles because lies are believable. You are certain that God doesn't have any plans for you. You can be positive that you can't forgive. You can be convinced that you cannot change. You can believe that compromise is the only way that you'll stay away from being alone forever. You can think that because you sin, you do not get a second chance. You can get it in your head that you can't be happy with these hard circumstances. Maybe you're certain that how it is today is how it will always be, and you are so stinking sure. And at a Bible college, you'll never say it out loud. But in this university, the lies are a part of your script too. You're dead wrong, but these lies are powerful. I've believed some of them, and so have you. And if your life is headed in the direction of your strongest thoughts, that unless you flip the script, unless you get some new information and find the truth, you will not be set 
free. That's why we need objective truth informing us, instruments giving us accurate readings that we can trust. We need truth outside of us to guide what's happening inside of us. We need God's word and God's truth saturating our minds, arresting our attention, and driving our actions. We need God's script to replace the script the devil has sold us. And so, if we all live by a script of unending thoughts made up of truth and lies, and if our lives will always go in the direction of our strongest thoughts, how do we delete the lies from our personal scripts and replace them with the truth? Well, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 is going to tell us how. So let's look at that together where Paul writes this, verses 3 and 4. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Notice that Paul is saying that this is war. It's serious. It's a, it's a battle, but it's not physical warfare. This is a war between truth and lies, a war fought on the battlefields of our minds. He goes on in verse 4. He says, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Well, what's a stronghold? It's a lie we live from. It's a lie that's been repeated so often, accepted by you so much that it dictates much of how you live. Like, I cannot be wanted unless I'm beautiful. I will be satisfied when I get enough stuff. I am what I accomplish. All lies, but they take root. They set up shop. They become part of the foundation of our stories and the way that we live our lives. See, strongholds are the lies that we live by. You have them, I have them, how do we remove them? Verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension, every lie, every godless way, every trick of the enemy. We demolish strongholds by taking captive every thought. That means to identify and to eject Every false narrative, every untrue story, every thought that, that doesn't come from Christ. And so throughout this day and this week and this year, I'm sure that God is talking to you. As the word of God is open, the truth will be proclaimed. And God wants to then sit down with you and have an editing session where he points out in your script where the lies are and shows you the truth that should and can replace them. And so I want to give you a process to work through to help you do this. We're going to go more in depth in the next two days, but here's the basic principle. Here's the process. Find it and flip it. Find it and flip it. Find it means to identify the lie. Step back from what you're going through throughout your day and ask yourself, and let me just say, like, one of the biggest gifts you can ever give yourself is just ask questions of yourself. One of the best things that you can do is to step back and ask, like, where is this coming from? What am I believing? What's underneath this emotion? To step back just for a few seconds and go, why am I feeling this? So just a couple weeks ago, I was, I was working on an email uh, that was going to go out to the whole church about uh, me leaving, going away to, to, to learn and grow and, and get trained for some more ministry and um, I sent that email into uh, my peers uh, on the team, and they shot back some, some edits. They're just kind of like, well, this is kind of confusing, and this, is, this would be more helpful, and you know, it's just something you do. We collaborate. But when I got the replies back, they bothered me. They just bothered me. I didn't like them. And so they ate at me for like part of the morning. And as I was driving from one place to another, I stepped back like I'm encouraging you to do, and I said, where's this, where this emotion coming from? Like, why this insecurity? And I realized that I was kind of putting some assumptions on the other people. Like, um, they don't think I have the, best, the church's best interests at heart, and so they're trying to, you know, fix that about my... And just things that aren't true. Things that aren't true about their edits. But I couldn't see it until I stepped back and asked a question about it. So let me encourage you to do that. As soon as I did, the emotions lifted because I realized they were lies in my script. After you identify it, then you want to you flip it. That means to replace it. And the goal of flipping the script is to replace the lie with a truth strong enough to live by. 
During World War II, on June 6, 1944, the Allies launched the largest seaborne invasion in history on the beaches of Normandy. It was a full-scale attempt to push back the German forces. 156,000 Allied troops fought to get a foothold in the French coastline. The Germans were well entrenched and the death toll was high. Only through tenacious persistence and great sacrifice did the Allies eventually gain control, destroy strongholds, and later gain victory. They used every weapon available to them to win. So, so that's Normandy. This is a Nerf gun. A Nerf gun fires foam darts. It's what children use to play at being soldiers. These darts are harmless. They have little force or power. They are a child's toy. That's a Nerf gun. Normandy, a picture of the very real and dangerous battle we're facing against the stronghold of lies in our minds. And the chances of getting taken out are great. The battle will be fierce until, and it will require every weapon you have to win. But I am afraid that we are charging into Normandy with Nerf guns, with pathetic pieces of truth, harmless foam darts that cannot win the, flight, the fight. We, we need truth, real, solid, sustaining trustworthy, sound. We need truth. We cannot win Normandy with Nerf guns. Nerf guns are things like those pious platitudes and empty optimism and simple positivity and self-improvement mantras and feel-good quotes on Instagram. See, the stakes are too high for us to play at war. We need the truth that sets us free. And so that's what you need to search for until you discover it. The truth that tears down the strongholds and sets you free. And it all starts in, in our minds. In the stories we tell ourselves. And let me just say, you will never in your entire life be in a better place to root out and replace the lies with truth than here. You will never be in a better place than be able to walk down the hallway and knock on a door in Jackson Hall and say, I'm not even sure what to call this, but I'm struggling with it. Can you help me identify, find it? And can you help me find the truth, flip it? This is your season. This is a time for you to take the script that you've carried into this room, make some edits with God, and come out the other side stronger. Let me just tell you about the script in my head. There have been times, many weeks really, where I've been sitting down in the, the front row at my church about to speak when fear attacks. And my script usually sounds like this. You don't know what you're talking about. What if you're wrong? What if you didn't define that word correctly and Dr. Lytle knows it? You can't do this. You don't belong up there. Who do you think you are? You are unworthy and you should just sit down. And you know what I used to do? I used to try to like shove that, that truth away and just kind of focus on whatever song we're singing at the time before I go up. I, I try to push down the fear and just kind of focus, but that didn't work. The lie would just sit like, like a pit in my stomach and and rob me of my joy and peace in doing what God has called me to do. Time after time after time, the script stole from me. Until I found Zechariah 4, 6, which says that victory comes not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And the truth set me free. Now, every time before I speak, I tell myself that verse. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And I don't know what the lie might be for you. You might, you might have blown it. Maybe sin has dominated your life and you have a whole tangled mess of, of lies that you're believing. You think God cannot forgive you, not really. You think that you can't really overcome, but maybe you'll just try to manage the sin. Or you think that God is, is done with you. And unless you want to stay there, you have to flip the script. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that God is poised and ready to forgive if you will confess because Jesus paid for it already. Romans 6, 6 and 7 
tells us that you can overcome sin because the power of Christ has conquered it and he lives in you. Philippians 1 6 tells us that God's never given up. He's never going to stop. He's never going to stop working in you and around you and through you. Or maybe there's someone in your life that you, when you look at them, you think like they're prettier or more popular or just more impressive than me. And so when you, you look at yourself, you think, I, I don't like what I see. You think, well, I'm ugly, and you think I'm unwanted, and you think I'm worthless. And even if you would never say those things out loud, you believe them, and your insecurity proves that you're living from them. And unless you want to stay there, you have to flip the script. Psalm 139, 14 tells us that the God who made the stunning stars in the sky, the breathtaking galaxy, the wonder of a waterfall, and paints a new sunset every night, that God... That master artist, he has created you, and you are a masterpiece. So stop believing lies of airbrush models and empty smiles. Psalm 139, 7 through 12, tells us that the God who can go anywhere and be with anyone wants to hang out with little old you. He likes being around you. You are wanted. And if you think you're worthless, well, you know the value of something by how much someone's willing to pay for it. And 1 Peter 1, 19 tells us that you were bought back with the most most precious, most valuable currency, not gold or silver, but the precious blood of Christ. So you are valuable. You have to replace the lie with the truth. And so as we wrap up today, can you imagine, can you imagine your life without your biggest hang-up? Can you imagine your life with, with your heart healed? Can you imagine how it changed your relationships if your insecurity was dealt with? Can you imagine what it'd be like to be set free? See, the journey towards freedom begins with a flip of the script. If you change your mind, you can change your life because your life will always go in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Let's pray. The lies lock us up, God but you came to proclaim liberty to the captives. And so God, I pray that as we go throughout today and this week and this year, that you would help us identify the lies. I would see through the smoke screen and the confusion the enemy throws up in our way. We'd identify the lies and find your truth, the life-giving, life-changing truth that sets us free. I pray that for these students, faculty, everyone here. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.